Okay, so thanks everybody for um, showing up and you're very welcome to Clyde Road and for all those dialing in online and through the webcast, you're all very welcome. We've people dialing in from San Francisco and Saskatchewan, so you're all very welcome. Um, for those in Clyde Road, uh, if I just ask you to turn off your phones or at least put them to silent, we have a fire exit uh, over to the side and if you could all sign in the attendance sheet, that'd be great. Um, so tonight's presentation is entitled The Review of Carbon Capture and Storage and be presented by Dr. Paul Dean of UCC. So um, Paul is a research fellow with UCC's Energy Policy and Modeling Group. His multidisciplinary research includes integrated energy modeling and assessing pathways to low carbon energy systems. Paul is also a member of the e Insight E-Group, which is a European scientific and multidisciplinary think tank for energy, which informs the European Commission and other energy stakeholders. So, uh, good evening everyone, thank you for coming out on such a bad evening to hear about my holiday to Canada. Uh, fair play to you all, thank you very much. Um, um, I'd just like to acknowledge maybe one person in the crowd first of all, that this trip was organised by the Embassy of uh, the Canadian Embassy in Ireland. I'd like to acknowledge Miss Jerry uh, Mongi here for, for uh, facilitating the trip from the Irish side. Uh, it was an excellent trip, um, very, very interesting. And what I'll do tonight is maybe share some of the lessons and some of the, I suppose, the experiences that we had over in Canada, um, some of the conclusions, um, and maybe some of the applications and maybe lessons that we learned, some of the experiences uh, maybe that we can uh, uh, glean from an Irish perspective. I've got a little video clip in the middle of one of the Canadian projects just to break up the evening a small bit. It talks about 30 or so minutes. Um, I mainly focus on the policy elements because that seemed to be the areas that were certainly of more interest over there uh, um, in, in Canada. So first a small bit about the work that we do down in UCC and where CCS fits in. So uh, the work that we do uh, really thinks a lot about the future in terms of how will we uh, fuel our cars, generate electricity, use our land, fuel our industries and what kind of lifestyles we will have in a future decarbonized Ireland. And Two things pop up predominantly in that modeling or in that element of work and those two things have a big impact on not only how we transition to a low carbon economy in Ireland but also the cost of that transition and also the pathways to that transition. And those two big policy areas are agriculture, which is 30%, 33% of greenhouse gas emissions in Ireland and also whether we deploy or do not deploy CCS as a technology. And it's interesting because if you look at the conversations that we have around energy in Ireland at the moment, we probably talk very little about those two policy elements. We talk about agriculture in very simplified terms and we certainly don't talk, I think, in, uh, in any reasonable terms about the uh, options to deploy or not with CCS. And this is replicated around the world. CCS is one of the fundamental technologies that's required to attain the Paris Agreement and the Paris Climate Change Agreement. And remember, Paris is not just about uh, reducing emissions in the global economy, it's actually about a net removal of emissions. And that kind of change can only be achieved through CCS as a technology. Uh, other, than other industries, fertilizer and cement, cannot decarbonize without carbon capture and storage. Uh, we can put as many nuclear power plants or solar panels or wind turbines as we want on a cement factory and it won't reduce the process emissions coming from that factory. Uh, so it's a key technology. It's not a particularly new or novel technology. I was just saying to John that in Norway they've sequestered 14 million tonnes of carbon dioxide since the 1970s. In the past 12 months alone, Canada has sequestered 3 million tonnes of CO2. Um, just maybe just to put those figures in context, millions of tons, it's, uh, they're hard to grapple with sometimes. Money Point, for example, which Shane spoke on last week, Money Point would have emitted maybe four and a half million tons, four million tons last year. Uh, Ryanair as an airline would have emitted seven million tons. Uh, us as individuals in Ireland, we have an individual carbon equivalent footprint of about 12 tons. So we're dealing with fairly substantial uh, figures here when we talk about Canada having sequestered 3 million tons of CO2. The technology is not, is not relatively novel but at the moment it's expensive and carbon capture and storage are big capital intensive projects, uh, big investment projects um, that are relatively uh, new on the scene I suppose in terms of the, uh, of the capital build that's required 
and they're different to other renewable or low carbon projects because they can't benefit from the replication or diversification of technologies that solar and wind have learned from. So for example, with a solar panel, you can quickly change something and try it again, or you can replicate it quite easily. These are big, lumpy investment projects, and essentially they do require some form of state or political buy-in in terms of, their, uh, uh, of, of, of making them financially feasible. Uh, today there are about uh, 30 to 40 CCS projects around the world, either at demonstration or pilot or operational phase. As I said, in Norway, the, in the North Sea, they've been burying CO2 uh, for the last, since, the, uh, since the 70s. And when you look at the history of CCS as a technology, actually, it's quite interesting. Um, I guess the, the heyday of carbon capture and storage, or the glory days, was back in 2005 when things were going well. Uh, all global leaders met up at the Glen Eagle Summit uh, to discuss decarbonizing the global economy. And there was a huge political uh, motivation to invest and pledge money to carbon capture and storage technology. We all know in this country what happened after 2005. Everything went crash, wallop, uh, the global economy crashed. Uh, with that, all those political pledges were pulled. And also, emissions reduced because of the decline and the retraction of the global economy. And this really took a lot, I suppose, of the political momentum from the sales of carbon capture and storage. But a number of countries have progressed, primarily Norway, and there was a Norwegian contingent came on the uh, trip as well with us, and countries like Canada are, are, are as well flying the, um, I suppose, flying the flag uh, for CCS. So there are some, there are financial challenges to the deployment of CCS it's technology, which we need to meet our climate reduction emissions targets. And there are also some there's financial, political challenges, but there's also, I suppose, more uh, conceptual challenges in the way that we think about energy, uh, particularly in, in Europe and more so in Ireland. Um, you know, CCS in Canada, particularly in the province of Alberta, is seen as one technology that's part of a wide suite or a, a range of, or a basket of other technologies that will enable a further decarbonization of the economy. It is not the sole technology that will deliver that. It has to be deployed in, uh, in association with strong energy efficiency me measures, deep retrofits on the residential, different sectors, energy conservation, mass deployment of renewables, behavior change, legislation change to encourage taxation. So it's a really kind of a sensible way to look at te te technology as part of a puzzle that can achieve a low carbon economy. Whereas in Ireland and in Europe, we're always looking for these kind of silver bullet solutions for essentially a problem that's too big to be solved by one single technology. And uh, it's not very helpful. And you, you see, you, you, you see I suppose, examples of this in the media and in the press the whole time, where rather than explaining to people how a single technology or a, or a suite of technologies or measures can advance the path to decarbonization by integrating with other technologies, what we do instead is that we focus on one single solution. And in Ireland, we have a particularly uh, a bad habit. It, and rather than explain to the public how things can work together, we instead focus on the faults of other technologies to advance our, uh, uh, to advance different, uh, I suppose, agendas and different, um, uh, different technologies. And we see this in arguments around that, well, we, we don't need wind because it's, it's too intermittent and we don't need any bioenergy because of sustainable issues. We don't need retrofitting because it's too expensive and we don't need CCS because it's, uh, a fossil, because it's fossil fuel rated. If we keep on going down that path, we're going we're gonna to eliminate all our options that we need for decarbonization. You know? So rather than focus on the faults of one individual, rather than focus on the faults of certain technologies, what we need to do is look at things in a holistic, whole systems manner, and figure out how things can work together uh, to achieve the decarbonization that's needed. So decarbonization, I don't think, or carbon capture and storage is not something I think that will compete with renewables. I think it will enhance renewables. And, in, uh, uh, and facilitate the integration of renewables within a wider decarbonization plan. And that pathway to decarbonization is extremely challenging. You know, you know, we use 11 million barrels, tons of oil equivalent in Ireland every year. Um, you know, a quarter of a million barrels of oil equivalent in energy every day. Uh, these challenges are huge, you know, not to be underestimated. 
Uh, we have a massive, we have one of the largest carbon footprints per capita as Irish citizens in Europe. And while we are reasonably good at renewable electricity, our deployment rates of renewables in Ireland are one of the lowest levels in Europe. We're adding renewables to the energy system in, in Ireland at a rate of, at a rate of 0.5% per annum. Okay, so in the year 2000, we had 2% renewable energy. Uh, 17 years later, we're at 8.5% renewable energy within our economy. So along with mass deployment of renewables and other measures such as energy efficiency, behavior change, we need to really have a mature conversation around technologies like carbon capture and storage to, to really expedite that, that transition to a low carbon economy. So that kind of sets the scene, I suppose, really in terms of where CCS fits in at a global level. Um, um, we'll do it, then we, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, my, my, my trip to Canada. Um, now, I was very lucky. Um, just when I finished college, I lived and worked in Canada for about five years. And when Jerry rang me up and said, will you come to Canada in February? I said, oh God, I've experienced the Canadian winters before. I know exactly what's coming. So went straight into Dunn stores, got myself a pair of double thermals, um, packed the, the suitcase, jackets and the whole lot, arrived over there. It was 16 degrees Celsius. It was uh, absolutely roasting. Uh, we were really confused, didn't know what to do. So I have a pair of double thermals uh, for sale on eBay if anyone wants to buy them. They've only been worn once, uh, worn once and probably won't be worn again. Um, um, now just a quick introduction before I jump into the Canadian policy stuff, just in case you're not familiar what carbon capture and storage is. Essentially it's removing carbon dioxide from, uh, uh, from the flue gas from uh, fossil fuels. There's lots of different types. Um, I won't have time to go into all the different technologies or the chemical side of things to this evening because it's not really, we don't really have sufficient time. But essentially, this is kind of what happens. Here, for example, on your left hand side, what you have is something like a power plant. And on the right hand side, in the, uh, the blue colored area, you have the, the carbon capture plant. And what happens is that rather than the flue gas go up the chimney and vent it out into the atmosphere, instead it's diverted into the carbon capture uh, plant. The flue gas is cooled. It comes into contact with a thing, a, a liquid solvent. And that liquid solvent, what they mainly use in Canada, is called a, a, a amine. And uh, ammonia can also be used. And essentially, what that solvent does is that it sticks onto the CO2, or the CO2 sticks onto that solvent. Solvent is pulled away, where it's reheated, where either with or regenerated, what's what it's called, with steam either from the plant. Um, the CO2 falls off. CO2 is sent uh, um, is compressed in a compressor piped to a storage area or piped directly uh, um, to some kind of, uh, in Canada it's primarily used for enhanced oil uh, recovery. The amine is recycled back into the plant and what's vented into the stack then is, uh, um, well you have some residues such as water, nitrogen and some other flue gases. Um, the amines in most technologies can, can remove maybe up to 90% of, uh, uh, of the CO2. And these liquid solvents aren't something new or novel, they've been used I think for the last 70 or 80 years in the oil and gas industry. And you see this a lot actually with, the, with CCS as a technology. The individual components and constituent parts have been actually trial and tested in the oil and gas industry for a long, uh, for a long period of time. And CCS is just essentially putting them all together uh, uh, and making them work. So one of the first ports of call that we went to, we visited the uh, Albertan government. We met some folks at the, uh, at the federal level. And what I really found interesting here, actually, and I was saying to, to John again, the conversations that we had over in Canada, they weren't about the technology working or not, or, or, the, or, the, uh, or, or is, it a, is it a, you know, will it or won't it work? They've moved well beyond that. It's a technology they're very familiar with. It's a technology that has been deployed at scale. And most of the conversations are actually about, well, how do we make a business case for taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it on the ground. Um, it's no surprise, I guess, that Alberta is leading this charge uh, within Canada. Alberta's home to, to the very controversial uh, oil sands or tar sands so we, uh, up in northern Canada. And the Albertan government, I guess, realized a number of years ago that there's no future to the to fossil fuels without carbon capture and storage. Uh, what's been interesting has been, there's been a number of change of governments, I suppose, within Alberta from a, from a conservative government to more uh, uh, liberal government. And the CCS has been able, I suppose, to ride out that transition and ride out that change, primarily because uh, 
there are industry champions within the province who, I suppose, champion the technology and keep things going during times of political inertia. Uh, so Alberta also had this head start when it came to carbon capture and storage there. They have a well-established oil and gas industry. Um, so they were able to borrow a lot of the legislation actually from existing oil and gas and translate that over to carbon capture and storage. Um, they did a lot of things wrong in Alberta within the oil and gas industry. There's a big problem with the abandonment of oil and gas wells. There's tens of thousands of, of abandoned oil and gas wells. So there's some lessons that they learned from there that they translated towards new legislation for carbon capture and storage. Uh, they had to change some legislation about who owns the ground under your feet. And there's different rights for different countries. Um, in Alberta, they have different rights for mineral rights. And they have a separate right then for who actually owns the pore space in the uh, uh, in the the rock or the basalt or the 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 the, uh, the 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 stone under your feet, so that to change some legislation to give government ownership of that pore space. Um, one of the things I suppose that became abundantly clear straight very early in the trip from talking to people over there, industry folks and policy folks, um, is the importance of a clear signal of a carbon price. Okay. So they don't have an ETS type system, a uh, European, uh, European uh, trading emission system that we have here in Europe. They have a fixed carbon price. So the carbon price today in Alberta is $25 per tonne and it's going to go up to $50 a tonne in the next number of years. That clear signal on carbon price makes the investment in these large capital intensive projects a lot, it, it de-risks a lot of those investments. Uh, um, in Europe, we're really facing the challenge in deploying carbon capture and storage because we will, it's very hard for investors to know what the carbon price will be in 10 years time, in two years time, in 40 years time. You know? So this is a real barrier, I think, uh, from a European perspective in not only not knowing what the carbon price is, but also not knowing what the trajectory of the carbon price is. Because if you don't put a penalty on releasing carbon into the atmosphere, um, projects like this cannot make any financial return. Uh, interestingly as well, the way they look at carbon capture and storage, they look at carbon dioxide as being a liability in the atmosphere. And essentially what CCS does is that it takes that liability from above ground, it de-risks it and puts it on the ground. And then the liability after a certain period, period of time is returned to the government of, uh, uh, of Alberta. Um, they also have, I suppose, learning from the lessons of the past, they have what is called a post-closure stewardship fund. And this is the amount of money that CCS operators must pay in. It's essentially a fund that's used for remedial works, uh, knowledge sharing, uh, advancement of the technology, R&D, uh, environmental upgrades and whatever. Uh, so if you want to build a, um, a carbon capture and storage plant um, in Alberta, you've got to go through these series of steps. And actually this policy document here that I showed here is well worth reading for anyone who's interested in the policy aspects. There's a site selection process. You must demonstrate that your site is safe, sound and appropriate for, uh, uh, for CO2 storage. And again, in Alberta, I guess they have a past, they have a history of 70 or more years of not only sequestering CO2, but also uh, uh, other gases on the ground. They have an initial permitting uh, period, pretty similar to the, 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 the EISs and the stuff that we have here in Europe. You have your operation of the plant. During the operation of the plant, there's very strict criteria on the monitoring, measuring, and verification. So if, when that CO2 goes into the ground, is it behaving as you expected? There's no leakages, there's no environmental damage or degradation. So all these things have to be monitored very, monitored very, very uh, carefully. Some companies used, uh, use radar to look at maybe um, subsidence or raising in the, uh, in the soil. They use different uh, ground-based and remote-based techniques to monitor uh, where that CO2 is going. When the project is finished, as a CCS operator, you didn't have to wait 10 years. So you have to continue your monitoring of the site for a further 10 years after the last day that you pump in the last ton of CO2. And this is very important because you have to demonstrate to the government before they assume the liability, you have to, you have to demonstrate that the site is, is de-risked, that the risk profile, if there is one, is decreasing. You have to demonstrate that the CO2 plume underground is behaving as you predicted or as you estimated. Uh, and you have, to, you have to demonstrate that that plume hasn't gone outside the area of, uh, that you have assumed for its storage. Once you can assume all that, 
um, within the period of 10 years. And you don't have to wait the 10 years. The more evidence that you can put forward to show that the site is de-risked and safe, the quicker you will get what's called a closure point or a closer, closer, closure permit. Uh, at that point then, the government accepts full liability for the site. So if anything happens after that, if there's a leakage or an environmental damage done afterwards, it's the liability of the government. So that's a 10 year period. In Europe, within the Carbon Capture and Storage uh, Directive, we have a 20 year period. So it's a much longer period of time. No, it's at least 20 years as specified. Uh, within the European Directive. And that makes it a bit more difficult for companies to budget these things um, because as well as in Canada and in Europe, if there's a leakage of CO2 from the site within that period, you pay the carbon price of the day for that leakage, which is fair enough, but it's very difficult again in Europe to estimate what the, what the carbon price will be in 2050 or 2060. So it makes things financially much more challenging, I think, for investment in, uh, in Europe in general. So that document is, 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 is well worth to read, uh, very interesting from a policy perspective, very broad. It doesn't just look at it from an environmental, but from a social, from a, a global perspective, uh, uh, and some really strict monitoring and independent monitoring, and really good lessons, I think, in terms of uh, transparency as well. Uh, the next project that we visited was the Alberta Trunk Line project. It's one of the world's largest carbon capture and storage projects. So we're just going to look at, I was going to put on a, a little, I think it's about a five minute video here. And what we'll do, this the video explains in much more elegantly than I can what this project is about. The scale of this project was absolutely uh, um, massive. So let's see, does this work? Okay. The Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, or ACTL project will be the backbone for large-scale CO2 capture and transmission in the province of Alberta and is key to developing CO2-enhanced oil recovery in Alberta. For the first phase of the ACTL project, carbon dioxide is captured from Northwest Redwater Partnership Sturgeon Refinery at Agrium's Redwater Fertilizer Plant, where it is compressed to a near-liquid state and transported via pipeline to an existing oil field near Clyde for enhanced oil recovery and carbon capture, utilization, and storage. The capture and pipeline system and Clyde EOR are owned and operated by Enhanced Energy, an Alberta-based oil company with extensive experience in building and operating CO2 EOR systems. The first phase will capture 5,000 tons a day of pure CO2 with an ultimate potential capacity of 40,000 tons a day. Extensive geological analysis has identified the Clyde Field as one of the premier geologic traps in North America for enhanced oil recovery with permanent CO2 storage due to its unique shape and secure geology. Millions of years ago, oil began migrating to the Nisku and Leduc reservoirs, where the tiny pore spaces within the dome-like structure of the carbonate formation have retained the oil in place. The oil and gases have been contained underground by a thick impermeable layer of shale or cap rock, hundreds of feet thick, that forms a barrier naturally preventing fluids and gases from rising to the surface. <coughs> Enhanced oil recovery with permanent CO2 sequestration or storage is a process where CO2 is injected into deep reservoirs to improve oil production and is a technique already used in more than 100 oil field operations in the United States and Canada. CO2 will be transported from the Alberta Industrial Heartland region to the Clyde field, where enhanced oil recovery with permanent CO2 storage will be used to extend the life of the Clyde oil field for more than 25 <coughs> years. The CO2 is injected in a liquid-like state, almost two kilometers underground. The equivalent of 10 Calgary Towers stacked one on top of the other. The CO2 travels down the well bore to a precise and predetermined location within the rock formation that provides the greatest enhanced oil recovery and permanent CO2 storage benefit. As the CO2 mixes with the oil in the formation, the oil swells and it also reduces its viscosity, allowing the oil to flow more easily through the interconnected pore spaces towards the production well which can result in 10 to 30% more oil production. This oil would not be able to be produced without a solvent agent such as CO2. 
During this process, the CO2 becomes trapped in the rock and is permanently stored in pore spaces. In the same way oil was trapped in the formation millions of years ago, with the cap rock serving as a physical barrier for the containment of the CO2. Other trapping mechanisms include the dissolution of CO2 in formation fluids and mineralization of the CO2 within the rock pore spaces. CO2 enhanced oil recovery can revitalize existing depleted fields, bringing production levels close to original levels and extending the operating life for more than 25 years. As fluids and gases are produced from the well, they flow through a series of vessels that separate them and enhance its separation facility. The oil is separated and stored in tanks prior to being delivered to market. A portion of the injected CO2 will be produced with the oil. This CO2 remains contained within the process system at all times. It is separated from the oil and is immediately combined with the CO2 arriving from Alberta's industrial heartland for reinjection into the formation. This is known as a closed loop process and ensures the injected CO2 is ultimately retained within the reservoir. Several methods will be employed to continuously monitor, measure, and verify the containment of the CO2 in the formation. Sophisticated detection techniques and equipment are used in the reservoir and on the surface to ensure the accurate and safe storage of the CO2, the protection of the underground sources of drinking water, and the public. Successful carbon capture and enhanced oil recovery with permanent CO2 storage in a project of this magnitude requires extensive skills, resources, and experience. Enhanced Energy has the requirements to successfully implement the ACTL project. Enhanced Energy is excited to lead the development of EOR and CCS in the province of Alberta, and to help establish Alberta as a leading environment steward. Okay, so that's that. And that's one of the things you see is, um, also is that you know to develop a business case for uh, for co2 in the absence of a strong carbon price that enhanced oil recovery is really one of those things that a lot of industries within that province is look at looking at now that project as well as a closed loop system actually so that's a a, a, a full co2 storage project uh, as well um, another project is probably more well known in the electricity sectors is the boundary dam power station this was a an incredibly expensive project, about 1.3 or 1.4 uh, billion Canadian dollars. Uh, about 800 million of that project was for the, the CCS plant itself. Uh, the remainder was for retrofits and upgrades uh, to the plant. Um, relatively controversial plant in Saskatchewan because it's, it's burning coal. Um, so um, a lot of people see it as throwing a lifeline to the fossil fuel industry. Um, the plant isn't without its critics. A lot of people are very critical of the cost. And again, the cost is high. Uh, and talking to folks, I guess, over there, some people point to the time that when this project was built, it was built during boom times, cost of steel, cost of labor were high, first of a kind technology. Um, but the cost of this type of technology do need to come down significantly uh, for more uh, um, uh, wide scale deployment. This is a post combustion CCS plant, so again, they capture the flue gas after it's uh, 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 after it's uh, um, they capture the flue gas after it's burned. Um, and there's a lot of good information actually on this particular power plant up on their website. You can monitor the availability. Um, availability has been poor. They've had some issues in, in the type of lignite that they burn uh, with this uh, with this plant and the boilers associated with that. Uh, whether those issues are specific to a power plant or specific to a CCS plant, it's, uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, but over the last number of months, the plant seems to have returned to normal operation. In the last 12 months, they have, sequestered, uh, they have captured uh, 1 million tonnes of CO2. That CO2 is then sent to an enhanced oil recovery, uh, I think 20 to 30 kilometres away. A small portion of that CO2 is actually used in for direct storage. Uh, so not a full storage plant, but does capture and store certain elements of the uh, of the plant itself. Um, for me, I think one of the more impressive uh, projects that we visited during the trip was the Shell Quest project, and not actually because of the the scale of the project, but actually because of 
I think what they were doing, or the way they were thinking about uh, the future of these projects. So the Shell Quest project is another 1.3 billion euro project. Again, in the last 12 months, it has sequestered and stored successfully over 1 million tons of CO2. And what this plant does is that it takes bituminum from the tar sands, from the oil sands in northern Canada, and that needs to be upgraded uh, to make synthetic crude. So you need hydrogen. And when you produce hydrogen from natural gas, you get CO2. So they capture that CO2 from that process using the aiming technology, and they transport it 40, I think it's maybe 65 kilometers away in a CO2 pipeline, and it's sequestered in two kilometers underground. Uh, the project has been running very successfully, I think, since its, since its inception. Uh, capture rates are uh, about 35%, so they, they plan and they capture 35% of the total CO2 emissions. Interestingly, they plan to build another two plants uh, capture facilities on this site. In terms of cost, as I said, 1.4 billion, huge capital intensive project. But from talking to the folks there, they suggested that they're covering their operational cost with the current carbon tax, which is $25 a ton. And they reckon that they will turn the project profitable if the carbon price goes over 40 uh, Canadian dollars a ton. And the way the Projects are set up in Alberta. When you receive grant assistance for these CCS projects, if you turn a positive revenue, all your grant assistance is cut off. So there's a element, I suppose, an element of a safety valve from a public's perspective in terms of funding going into these projects. One of the things I was surprised with this project actually was uh, the way they were thinking about stakeholder engagement. And this comes back to the thing I was saying at the beginning about, about CCS in Canada. The conversations have moved well past the technology and more about making business cases for the technology and getting public buy-in and support for these, uh, these projects. Um, I got talking to one of the Shell uh, stakeholder or, or engagement or environmental people about the whole process, and I thought it was fascinating. Uh, I asked her had she ever heard of Corb, and she said she hadn't. So I, I didn't want to wreck her day, so I, I didn't bother going into it. Um, but these are some of the, uh, the things that they did as part of the stakeholder engagement. But there's a lot we can learn from, from I think, the way they're thinking over there. Uh, and she gave me a couple of pointers on some of the things that they think about. And very interesting and very, I think, reflects a very broad and surprising way of thinking. The first thing she said that was interesting was um, these are, you know, billion dollar projects. You know, um, any local community who are unhappy or are, are, are unsatisfied can stop and kill your project. So stakeholder engagement has to be first and foremost on your agenda. First contact with communities is hugely important. She said, you do not send your, uh, you do not send your uh, external consultants, you do not send your junior staff to talk to the people who's, who, who's, who's, I suppose whose lives you are discommoding with this project. You send your high-level executives. You take off their shirts and ties, you put on a, 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 a T-shirt or a pair of jeans, and you go and visit all the people in the, on, the pipe, on, the, on the pipeline or on the route. Now, they have much lower population densities over there, okay, so it's probably an easier thing to, uh, to grapple with. Um, and when they make those connections, because people want that element of trust, and they want, they want to see that you're serious about these projects, so meeting high-level people displays, I suppose, that certain level of trust. Secondly, she said, you can't sell it as a Disneyland project. These, you have to be honest and mature about the risks and about the things that can go wrong with your project, either during the construction phase, during the operation phase, or during the post-closure phase. Because if you don't tell people about the risks of your project or the stuff that can go wrong, somebody else will. And they will take ownership of that narrative and they might amplify it or distort it. So you have to be open and honest about all the things that can go wrong and then explain to people about the contingencies and the plans you have in place to mitigate against that and then let people decide. So you never talk about low probability or low probability events. People don't care about a low probability event if you're the person who it's probably going to happen to. So you've got to strip back all the technical jargon. You've got to be open about, I suppose, warts and all about your project and explain to people. Because you said, you know, people aren't stupid, you know. They know if you're trying to sell them something that's sugar-coated and that will come, uh, that will come back to, uh, uh, to haunt you or bite you. Uh, so a very... I suppose a very different, very transparent way in thinking uh, uh, um, uh, about these types of projects. You have to make all your information completely transparent. Uh, Shell for this project worked a lot with NGOs, with community groups, um, and making that data available for them to analyze and to, to go through. 
the, the, the third thing that she said was interesting was in terms of around public meetings and, and stakeholder engagement. They tended to avoid the town hall format. And they said the town hall format works for some people, but you'll always get someone who's a bit more shouty or a bit more angry than everybody else. And that will either intimidate people or will influence people in a negative way. So they looked at different ways of how can people ask questions about the project or learn information about the project. And what they said that they did was they looked at where people congregate. And they said, where do people congregate during the day? And in this part of Canada, it was in coffee shops in the morning or in the afternoon. So they went there with no posters, no maps or no technical jargon. They sat there for a number of days, invited people in for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee where you can come in, people can ask in a, a safe, controlled space about the project. They invited people from local police, church, uh, uh, teachers, schools to come in. And they weren't brought there to endorse the project or to give it a seal of approval. They were there to encourage people to ask different and diverse questions. Uh, so giving people access to a space where they can actually hear the full information about the project uh, seemed to be very, very important. Uh, they built a 65 kilometer CO2 pipeline operating at about 18 bar um, um, with no public hearings and no public objections. I thought that was phenomenal, you know. Now again, you're dealing with a, you're dealing with a, a society that's very familiar for energy infrastructure, okay. They're, you're dealing with people who are familiar with oil and gas. In Ireland, because we, we only produce 15% of our own energy, we're not familiar with the energy infrastructure or the infrastructure that comes with producing energy. Uh, and in many ways, that makes the challenge in Ireland, I think, uh, uh, a bit more, uh, a bit more difficult. But certainly, I think some lessons that we can learn there in terms of openness and honesty uh, 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 and and communication uh, about projects. Um, so just towards the end of the trip, we also, I suppose, look, we met a couple of companies who were involved in uh, the utilization of carbon within different uh, technologies. We met a wide range of companies. I just picked out two uh, of these companies here, one in the cement industry and other in the residential heating industry. Um, now, utilization of carbon is important. If you can make, it's nice if you can make a business case for it, but in terms of scalability and storage, it would be dwarfed by the the, the 3 million tons that they've stored in, in, in Canada last year. Here we're talking about very, le very small levels of utilization of CO2, maybe in the, in the, in, in, in the tons uh, or, uh, or maybe kgs rather than, rather than anything in the, in, the, in the megatons. One of the companies I thought was quite interesting was uh, Carbon Cure. A uh, very nice and simple idea here actually. What they realize is that if you inject CO2 into, into, uh, into let's get this right now, into concrete mix, it increases the tensile strength and you actually require less cement in the mix. Okay, So if you inject a certain amount you require 10% less cement. And this is a double benefit because not only are you um, sequestering CO2 in the building material but you're also emitting less CO2 into the atmosphere because you need less cement. Um, one of the neat things that they come up with here was, so they developed their business case around that, around that it's, a, it's kind of a no-brainer for the cement industry because it gives you an excuse to use less cement and it doesn't cost a lot. Interestingly, the CO2 that they're using here has to be bought commercially and they're competing with the soft drinks industry actually. So as prices and demands for soft drinks go up, uh, the price of this technology uh, um, uh, goes up and down with it. This is a, what they call a plug and play technology. There's no expensive retrofit within the concrete plant. It's just something that, that a pipe basically that goes into, uh, into the, uh, the mixer and injects it in. It's simple as that. It's mixed in the truck. Um, uh, what was I going to say about that? The, um, and the technology is, is being deployed in, in, I think, 20 or so uh, concrete plants uh, around the province, and they have plans to even bring it to Europe. Um, I guess from a structural engineering perspective, one of the things that they were quite specific about, that this technology cannot be used in all specific types of cements. It can be used in general, general cement or general, general concrete. Um, and one of my colleagues pointed out that maybe certification in Europe could be a bit more challenging. Uh, but nonetheless, it's always quite a clever idea and a different way of using uh, CO2. The other company that are, I was really impressed with was a company called Clean CO2. And here what they do is, this is aimed at the, uh, uh, at the heating sector in commercial, uh, commercial heating and residential heating. And what they do is they develop this, it looks like a desktop computer here actually, but this is a unit probably around this side in a commercial system. It's essentially uh, an add-on unit that goes onto a boiler. And what they do is, and I can for the life of me remember the powder. They have some, they have some uh, powdered, 
chemical solvent that's burned in the presence uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the gas. And what it does is it actually captures the CO2 coming off the, off the gas. It's an exothermic reaction, so you get extra heat. That heat is diverted back into the boiler, so you end up using a, a, li a little less heat, and you also end up capturing some CO2. Um, they, can, they said they can capture up to 20% of CO2, reducing CO2 emissions from these uh, gas-fired units uh, uh, by 20%. And what they produce is actually a waste product called soda ash. Now, I never heard of soda ash before, but apparently we all use lots of it in laundry deterrent, uh, soaps, uh, shampoos, conditioners. Uh, and there's a market there for this kind of stuff. So what these folks do is they sell, the, they collect the soda ash at the end of every month, or at the end of every six month from these boiler type things, and they sell it back to the soda ash industry. And they get a slight price premium because it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's uh, I suppose it's more a more a more environmentally uh, friendly product because currently all the soda ash they get into. Uh, into Canada's mines and places, in, in deep mines in Wyoming and stuff like this. So, um, the web addresses for those companies are up there. And I think these folks are coming over to Ireland in August. Uh, if anyone wants to chat to them again, maybe Jerry might be able to help you out with, uh, with some of the contacts there. So, that's kind of a quick whistle-stop tour of the, uh, of the CCS tripping in, uh, in Canada. And just maybe take one or two short slides just on opportunities for CCS in Ireland. As I said, CCS is one of those technologies that comes true in our analysis that, that has this uh, really significant impact on the cost of achieving a low carbon technology and also the deployment paths to that low uh, carbon technology, a low carbon future. Uh, there's been a lot of work done in Ireland, background work and the new preliminary work on CCS in Ireland. Uh, SLR have done, uh, with SAI, have done um, uh, some studies on the on storage potential, geological storage potential. Uh, I know Shane from uh, uh, ESB, who's here tonight, have done some background work, Arvia have done some background work at looking at the opportunities for CCS in Ireland. Um, again, our whole systems modelling within UCC would show that CCS could play a very important role in decarbonising the power system in Ireland. And we see it rather than uh, competing with renewables, it does really enhance the role of renewables within the grid, uh, within the power system. Um, particularly if you're looking at things from a reliability, from a security, and from a robustness perspective. Uh, and especially with dealing with very technical, tricky issues uh, like system inertia. Um, in our scenarios, without CCS, we would see an increase in costs. We would see marginal abatement costs increasing by about 30% uh, without uh, carbon capture and storage deployed as a technology. So essentially your carbon uh, your marginal abatement costs will go from maybe 450 euros per ton up to about 600 euros a ton. Those costs seem high, uh, but to decarbonize the full European energy system, the European Commission reckon we would need carbon <laughs> prices in the region of 300 euros a ton. Uh, so those costs are kind of uh, reasonably within ballpark when you're looking at the scale of the challenge of decarbonization um, uh, within, uh, within Ireland and within Europe. So just to finish off, I guess, what did I learn from my, uh, my little trip over to Canada? Well, you know, the technology works, the policy doesn't. Uh, I did a little blog piece recently, and, you know, one of the things that I said was that, you know, we have a, we have a policy system that makes it easier to develop a business case to put CO2 into Coca-Cola than it does to take it out of the atmosphere. And with all the science that we have around the Paris Agreement and all the science that we know about CO2 as a greenhouse gas, that's a, that's a pretty ridiculous situation to be in. Um, political and policy buy-in is fundamentally necessary for this type of technology. The investments are too big uh, um, really to be met, I think, without state assistance. Uh, and they're too important, uh, I, I think, as well. Uh, you'll also need political and policy buy-in on the storage element side, looking at the Alberta case, where the, they take responsibility for the storage site once it's de-risked after the lifetime of the project. And also, I guess, what we're need to understand in Ireland and in Europe, you know, what's our plan for decarbonisation? Uh, we don't really have one at the moment. We've broad aspirations to decarbonise the system, but we've no pathway. And in the absence of a plan for decarbonisation, it's very difficult to see how technologies like CCS, renewables, efficiency, transport, how they all can fit in and gel together to work towards uh, that low carbon future that we have essentially politically and socially signed up to.
So I will leave it there, and John, we can take some we can take some questions. I think John has a has a, a microphone here, and just for the folks online, if you can just maybe shout out your name and uh, and, uh, and and use the microphone if that's possible. If there are any questions, so thanks, John. Thank you. Brilliant, Paul. Thanks again for an excellent presentation. Maybe just to kick off the the Q and A um, on the political policy perspective, how important is, is a fixed carbon price or at least a, an elevated carbon price yeah. in that discussion? Oh, it's everything really, you know, it's, I think it's, it's hugely important because again, you know, if you're, if you don't put a penalty price on emitting to the atmosphere, there's no incentive to not emit it, there's no incentive to store it. So uh, it's, it's fundamentally important and you see that in places uh, like Canada in offshore Norway where the offshore carbon tax is three times the price of the onshore tax. It does encourage companies to think before they emit, um, and it's, I guess it's not so much the the price; it's also having a clear trajectory on that price. Because if you're trying to work these out in a balance sheet, you need to have a clear vision of what the next 20 years uh, 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 will uh, will uh, will look like. And in the absence of that certainty, what you're going to have is situations where companies put in so much contingency built around the uncertainty that they make the projects financially unfeasible. Yeah. Well, uh, Shane O'Sullivan from ESB. Um, I've got uh, one comment and two questions. Uh, so just on one comment um, would be when, when talking about CCS, so carbon capture and sequestration, um, the technology and, and is, is really applied to the carbon capture bit. So um, you can use the aiming process to, to take the CO2. But when you want to look at costs and, and people who, who use, say, for the electricity industry, levelized cost of electricity to compare different uh, decarbonization uh, technologies, the, the important thing to note about CCS, maybe relative to other uh, low carbon generation technologies, is that it's very, very, the costs are very project specific. Uh, so the carbon capture component, you can work out calculations like that, and, and Boundary Dam have said that they can do that 30% cheaper if they were to do it again than when they put it in. But you also have to then take into account the specifics of the project, so the, the length of the pipeline, where you're actually storing it, uh, whether you can reuse existing infrastructure, how deep the well will be that you're, you're, and what pressure as you have to do with it. So it's just worth noting um, when you're talking about CCS that maybe a technology might be the right word, but it's a whole specific uh, system of everything that has to work well and, and, and borrows from the um, oil and gas industry, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, then I have, I have two questions. Um, I suppose just in, in your, your modeling then for the, the Irish um, decarbonization system, I'm just wondering um, if you see CCS coming first on the electricity sector or if you see it coming first in the industrial sector. I mean, our first question and the second one, in for the electricity sector, if you were to use CCS, you, you have a choice of fuels. It's, it's removing of carbon dioxide from, from any exhaust stream. So I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about whether you'd see it on uh, biomass mass, peat, coal, gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, for your first point, Jane, I completely agree. Uh, and, and thanks for that comment, yeah. And as well, we must remember that uh, the cost for retrofit projects could be substantially lower again. Uh, and depending, uh, this was interesting actually for the conversations that we had over in Alberta where they were talking to the Norwegian folks um, and they looked at the offshore facilities that Norway had access to. So the, some of the Canadian folks were looking in kind of admiration at the offshore storage potential that they had in Norway and the access to that. Um, so yes, you're right, the, the, it's, it's the costs are like, like, even hydro, like even hydro storage, they're, they're, they're fundamentally site specific. Um, within the modeling that we do in UCC, we would see CCS coming into the power system first of all, um, primarily just because uh, the marginal abatement costs in industry are, are, are higher. Within the industry in Ireland, it's primarily cement that we're, uh, 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 that we're looking at. <coughs> Whether a what's the fuel or what's the feedstock would primarily come would primarily be determined on the assumptions you make around gas prices and coal prices and pri and as well the price ga the gas um, the gas coal price differential uh, they influence the, the the I suppose the outcome in terms of what would be the choice of fuel uh, for CCS. Um, other types of things that influence that cost would be distance to your storage site, storage uh, uh, capacity. So, so I suppose to answer your question, the, the type of CCS that comes through primarily depends on the uh, um, decisions or the assumptions you make around, around fuel prices and some of those technology costs. Uh, but I guess what's insightful around the modeling is that you can examine those costs. In general, what we see is if the, if the, go, if the coal and gas 
uh, price differential is relatively short, we would see gas ECS coming through. Uh, but again, that's something that would be driven by an assumption rather than may or may not be realised. And it's a difficult question for investors as well, you know, because not only do you have to take a, um, I suppose, a position on what long-term carbon prices will be in capital costs, but you also need to take a position on what long-term fuel prices will be. And that's, that's, a, that's a difficult, that's a difficult uh, question as well. So thank you, Shane. Uh, Nick O'Neill from, from SLR, uh, thanks a lot for, for that, uh, that talk, very, very helpful. Um, one of the things that we struggle with when we're looking at the, the business model is even where the geography is, is correct, in other words, where you have a geographically a geological storage site, you probably have existing infrastructure which uh, is, is ready for decommissioning. When you look along the, the supply chain, so even, even if you did have EOR, for instance, the mix of companies in that supply chain inherently have different expectations. Mm -hmm. And we often struggled, uh, even yeah. looking at the situation in Ireland, who is the facilities uh, manager likely to be, who's going to be at that end? You know, the pipeline side is clear enough if it's mm -hmm. the power sector it's clear enough, um, the uh, industry suppliers. <coughs> mm -hmm. But inherently, we still struggle with the contracts that one would put in place along that supply chain. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, in Canada, where, how are those contracts uh, worked out and who are, who are the big winners and yeah. who are the, uh, the ones who? Oh, interesting question, Nick. Yeah, you're, you're, I guess, again, it comes back to that head start that they have in places like Alberta where they have an established oil and gas industry and uh, I suppose they've established supply chains. And not only do they have those established supply chains, but they have large companies who are used to dealing with those supply chains. So, um, like, for example, that oil refinery project that we visited, that was in construction uh, during that time. There's 5,000 people working on that site. Uh, they were ahead of schedule, ahead of budget. Um, so I guess you have competences with those scale of companies. And not only, I guess, what comes with those scale of companies is also access to finance, access, access to expertise. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, a, it's, it's, it's a difficult question to, uh, uh, to answer, but, you know, they didn't develop those expertise overnight. It was through a long, uh, you know, a long 70 or 80 year process. Um, um, yeah, so, yeah, unfortunately, I, I, I can't give a, a definite answer because I really don't know. Hi, hi Paul. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was, it was excellent, very concise and uh, informative. Um, so I'm, I work for Shell, um, most recently in development planning, so it was good you were nice to us. Um, <laughs> so I know colleagues of mine who've worked on Quest and also up in Peterhead on the CCS, the failed CCS project there. Um, and from a Shell perspective, I know CCS was looked at part of a solution. So if Shell are investing 10 billion, um, investing another billion, okay, it's, it's, it's important, but it's not as big a deal as investing that amount in, in isolation. Um, and I know where I struggle with CCS is, I think my, like most people, how you make it, um, how you justify it, how you financially justify it. Um, in Ireland, um, and I suppose in, in the EU, are there examples of isolated CCS projects um, that have been justified by, be they semi-private or private um, investors? So within the power sector, no, not yet. So I guess the most active, and Shane, please feel free to jump in if, uh, if there's more uh, relevant information. Um, I guess the, the the current big project in Europe at the moment would be the Rhodes project in the Netherlands, which is a, 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 I think a coal uh, uh, CCS project. Uh, but you're you're correct, and that's 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 where it comes back to the point is that we have a technology that works, but we have a we have a policy that doesn't reward taking uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere. There's other challenges in Europe that we that they don't have in places like uh, like Canada. So, so for example, in Europe, we correctly give priority dispatch to renewables. Okay, so the renewable energy directive gives priority access to, 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 to renewable energy. Now, that might be changing over the next number of years. But if you're a carbon capture and storage plant, you don't get that privilege. Uh, you have to get in on merit. Uh, so you could end up being very successful in attaining a, a, a grant or EU funding to help build a CCS project. But if you can't get onto the market, you've got no way of proving the project. Uh, there's been CCS plants in Norway that they've had to mothball 
Um, now Norway is a difficult country as well for I think for uh, an, for a power sector CCS plant to cut its teeth because you're competing with a hydro-based zero carbon electricity competitor. Um, so we've got all these obstacles that are that are you know incredibly challenging. You know, so I think it's no it's no surprise to see I suppose the uh, the lack of appetite to, to build out these projects from the private sector. And that's where I think the need for the, the political and policy buy-in is needed to give some certainty. You know, renewable energy projects correctly get refit and AERs and these kind of things, which give those investors uncertainty. You wouldn't build a wind farm or a solar plant without those certainties. Um, and should we look at maybe giving some of those privileges over to low carbon technologies as well? Uh, that's something that we really have to discuss within Europe, because in the absence of that, uh, these are, are very risky investments. Hi, Paul. Uh, Peter Davis, CSP. I think you may have partially answered the question I was going to ask you, but if you were asked to give advice to the European Commission to get carbon capture and storage going in Europe, what would be the first thing you'd say to them? Yeah, thanks, Peter. No, and I think, you know, the, the, um, the Climate Change Advisory Board that we have here in, in Ireland has done a good thing. Re done, well, they've done many good things recently, but I thought one of the, the really important elements was encouraging Minister Nocton to lobby for a carbon floor in Europe. So we have a dysfunctional ETS in Europe at the moment. Okay, you now the Commission will say, oh look, the ETS is delivered, we're 16% ahead of emissions. But the price to stimulate low carbon investments hasn't materialized. And what we need is, look, we either need a, 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 a massive overhaul of the ETS, which is not going to happen, or else we need some kind of carbon floor price. Because in the absence of the carbon floor price, it's extremely difficult, I think, for investors to take, you're, you're essentially asking them to take a punt on these investments, not, o not only over the lifetime of a project, which spans many political cycles and lots of things can happen politically, but then in Europe, you're asked to take responsibility for the project for 20 more years after the closure period. So certainty is what's needed, yeah, you know, but in, at a European Council level, at a Euro European Parliament level, we still have this identity crisis where we're grappling between a high renewables future and a low carbon future. We're all realizing that they're actually mutually the same and that we need mixes of, of, of both. So I think recommending for some kind of stability within DTS primarily to a carbon price floor that is predictable and allow, allows investors to see beyond that political cycle is something that's, uh, that's needed. Paul, uh, how are you doing? Good. <laughs> Just for a moment, I was actually on the trip with Paul. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, 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 uh, I was late because... You showed a picture of you cutting the lawn earlier on. Actually. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, very good. I won't, I won't talk about that night in Edmonton then. <laughs> um, just, I don't know, I was late in because my, my wife still thinks uh, I'm, I'm looking after the baby because I've been away for the week. But um, uh, I don't know whether you covered this or not, um, but one of the things, and it, it goes back to... Uh, your question down there about um, you know the financial viability and how you financially make this work. Um, I remember when we were on on the Quest project, mm. and Tim was talking about the cost of CC uh, US mm. for Quest, and he's talking about the cost at the moment was twenty five dollars a ton of CO two. Mm. Uh, that was the cost of of actually um, sequestering the CO two, uh, and that the carbon credit to get off it was fifteen dollars a ton. And he was talking about a 20 or 30% reduction in that next time they do it because they learned lessons learned and whatnot, which brings it about down to about 18, 19 dollars a ton. And his firm belief was that the uh, in, in Alberta anyway, um, uh, which you know wouldn't be the most green <laughs> of provinces in Canada, um, it would, the carbon credits are heading towards 50 dollars a ton, yeah. which would my my very limited knowledge of the thing make it very financially viable. Um, so uh, in terms of actually uh, how you actually make this uh, work going forward, it's, it's going to be policy driven, uh, as, 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 as you've said, right? Um, I mean, something similar to what happened to wind power in this country when they, uh, when they, when they started um, giving you a $14, uh, $0.14 cent a kilowatt hour. The policy drove it. Um, looking forward, I know you're talking about a carbon floor. Uh, uh, but do you foresee um, policy put in place in Europe to actually make it financially worthwhile in this part of the world, like they have in Alberta, uh, or, or, or do you think there's a bit of a? I know in Ireland there's a bit of there's a bit of an antip antipathy towards it, but in Europe, yeah. is there is there is there a push towards 
uh, getting the correct policies in place to actually make it a viable technology uh, going forward. Yeah, well, I suppose the yeah, and it's a great, great question, Donna. You know, and I suppose the technology, is it te te technology is viable. It's just making the business case from the current environment. I suppose just those figures that they quoted in the Shell Quest project, the twenty-five dollars a ton was to cover their operational cost, mm -hmm. and they're reckoning they'd turn a profit once they got over. And they pay off the investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, now again, what's di what's what's interesting when you, if you look at the spread of business cases that are used to make um, uh, CCS profitable, enhanced oil recovery, which is very dependent then on the price of uh, of oil, um, uh, which is you know at a, a pretty low ebb at the moment. Uh, pure storage projects will require a, a, a more more or less a, a, um, a strong carbon signal. Will it happen in Europe? I really don't know. You know, it's that uh, you have a lot of uh, different interests. Uh, um, vying for uh, attention within Europe. Um, it's incredibly difficult. I think the carbon floor in the UK has been a positive thing. There's been some polit pullback politically, which makes it's it very, very... Europe anymore, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then looking to Europe. Um, it's very difficult to say whether this will happen or not, you know, but I think it's going to be very difficult for the European, European Commission to encourage CCS in an investor environment that's just wrought with, uh, with uncertainty. Um, uh, and if you look at the resistance to change at European Council and Parliament level to the ETS, and even look at the the debacle in the last two weeks, what's happened within the ETS, uh, you know you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of interest at play. So I would like to think it will happen, uh, but the, the the optimist in me says it will happen, but the pragmatist in me says that it's uh, maybe we're a long way off from that yet. Jerry Darkin, Academy of Engineering. Sorry for coming in late, Paul, but I was busily emitting CO2 as I was stuck in a major traffic jam outside. <laughs> and nitrous uh, oxide, Jerry. Yeah. Yes. And whatever else you're having yourself. Uh, a few comments. One is, uh, you mentioned the Quest project, but we must remember the Quest project was dealing with a totally pure CO2 stream coming out from the uh, uh, production of hydrogen. That makes life an awful lot easier. And now, if we look here, uh, Effectively, the highest CO2 concentrations we have are coming out of cement kilns, mm -hmm. which is about 50% CO2 at the kiln outlet. It's less than the chimney, but it's 50% of the kiln outlet. That makes CO2 sequestration there. That is the cheapest place we can actually sequester CO2. Mm -hmm. If you go to Money Point, you're dealing with a 20% CO2 concentration. And if you go to the CCGT plants, you're dealing with a 5%. CO2 concentration, which means you're talking about extraordinarily large pieces of kit to actually handle the volume of material to strip out the 5%. Yeah. It makes it extremely difficult. Now, then if you look at the storage opportunities, I mean, there was an extensive study done, and a, a competent study done uh, by various parties commissioned by the department here in Northern Ireland authorities within, the, uh, within this jurisdiction. There was no suitable location found in the Money Point area. Okay, Kinsale Field is the obvious one, despite reservations expressed by the gentleman sitting next to me. We'll come to that later. Uh, and there was some talk of going over the, the Irish Sea uh, across to the gas field there. Uh, I think it was pointed out by Shane in his lecture that the Peter had proposal fell to pieces, not necessarily because of technology or even possibly because of cost, but because the interfaces couldn't be addressed. I think suggesting that we could go across the IRC and give it to the Brits, uh, I suggest the interface difficulties are such that I think we should adopt a certain level of reasonable you know, scepticism that that could ever happen. And that leaves us with uh, the concern field as being the only viable disposal site we have in the country. And the Academy in its study found okay that even when you allowed the kind of fairly elevated CCS costs we're looking at in gas-fired plants, the total capital expenditure to achieve a certain level of CO2 per megawatt hour was less than doing the same via wind power. Now, the operating costs would be higher, but the capex was significantly lower. And the plea we would make from the Academy is that we be absolutely careful that when Kinsale is decommissioned, that it is decommissioned in a manner that allows for its future use as a CCS reservoir. And, you know, I would just say it's very important that we make that because if you don't do it properly, 
It's useless. Congratulations to you on the delivery and your uh, paper this evening. M my question is a straightforward one. Is there a ratio between the cost in terms of unit of power required uh, to the cost of completing any of the generations you've already described for the recovery of the, uh, of the, of the carbon? I mean, basically, we're not talking so much about money. We're really talking about a ratio. Please, thank you. No, and you're right. And that's something. Uh, thanks for the question. That's something I, I didn't mention. Compared to a typical power plant, you're going to lose because you've got to operate compressors and different parts of the machinery. You're going to you lose some anything from eight to fifteen percent of your uh, uh, of your of your energy usage. So that's what we call parasitic demand. So there is a there is an energy penalty. Uh, that comes with uh, with the the carbon capture and storage unit that's associated with it, which which would not be associated with a conventional uh, power plant. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think we, we'll Great, call thank the mic. Thank um, Paul, thanks a million for excellent presentation, and again, thanks for everybody. <laughs> in the audience. I suppose before wrapping up, um, I'd like to bring your attention to some events. We have a busy month coming up ahead for the Energy Environment Division. Uh, we have a seminar on the 29th of March here in Clyde Road entitled Reducing Transport Emissions. So that will be an all-day seminar. Uh, we have a number of very very interesting and cutting-edge speakers on that. So that's uh, here on the 29th of March. Uh, we're also hosting a breakfast briefing on the morning of Monday the 5th of April on the topic of near zero energy building standards. And the NZEB standards, that's become a real hot topic uh, recently. And, uh, Again, it should be an excellent event. And then, obviously, our next lecture is on Wednesday, the 5th of April, which will be, uh, again, another extremely interesting joint presentation on the topic of Ireland's 2030 climate change targets. And um, Jerry will be a co-presenter on that night, Jerry from the uh, Irish Academy of Engineering, and also Neil Walker from IBEC here in Clyde Road. So just to conclude, again, we've already given a round of applause, but thanks again to Paul for, for a great uh, presentation. Very well thought out as usual from Paul and thanks everyone for attending and for dining in. So have a good night. Thank you.